Prime Minister Nguyen Tân Dung attends Mekong Japan Summit. Review of 20 years of U.S. investment in Vietnam. Hello from Hanoi and welcome to this line brought to you by VTV International. You're with me, Linh Hương, and as usual, we'll start with several highlights in the economic scene for the past week. Prime Minister Nguyen Tân Dung attends the 7th Mekong Japan Summit slated for July 2nd to the 4th in Tokyo at the invitation of his Japanese counterpart, Shinzo Abe. Speaking at the event, Prime Minister Zhou emphasized the need to foster the Mekong Japan cooperation towards supporting socio-economic development in the Mekong subregion in general and in Vietnam in particular. The ongoing summit in Japan has significant meaning in passing Tokyo Strategy 2015 and mapping out cooperation orientations between Japan and five Mekong nations, including Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand and Vietnam in the 2016-2018 period. The Ministry of Finance and the State Securities Commission co-organized a trade promotion conference for the United States from the 1st to the 5th of July. The event is designated to create a discussion channel for U.S. businesses to better understand and strengthen their belief in Vietnamese investment environment. The conference consists of a policy discussion and a business-to-business talks. It's also expected to create new opportunities for the business communities of the two countries to find finance and trade partners. The government discussed socio-economic development in June and the implementation of this Resolution 19 on measures to improve the investment environment and the national competitive capacity. Leaders of 63 provinces and cities across the country participated in the online meeting. According to Ministry of Planning and Investment, CPI this month continued its low rise of 0.35% from last month. This underlined the country's continued stable economic growth. The second quarter GDP was estimated to increase by 6.44% compared to last year's second quarter. This offers signs of fast economic growth. Last year, only 1% of local enterprises invested in the agriculture sector in rural areas. Boosting agriculture investment in the rural areas among local enterprises is the main topic of a conference held in Hanoi on Monday by the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development and the World Bank. Addressing the conference, Deputy Prime Minister Wang Chunghai stressed the need to create favorable policies to attract more enterprises to invest in rural areas and thus raise incomes for local farmers. The Deputy Prime Minister also pointed out some weaknesses that need to be solved, including the weak connection between farmers, enterprises and scientists. Other opinions from local enterprise representatives at the conference pointed out several obstacles preventing them from investing in this sector. <laughs> Vietnam's textile industry has witnessed steady growth in recent years and recent free trade agreements or FTAs the country has signed with South Korea and the Eurasian Economic Union are pushing the country to become one of the top textile exporters in the world. According to the Vietnam Cotton Fiber Association, by 2030, garment production worldwide will expand to twice its size, with Asia contributing to 60% of total production. Vietnam is expected to be an attractive destination for foreign textile investors because of its competitive labor, stable political situation and a favorable business environment. During the first six months of this year, the sector's export growth hit two-digit growth. Revenue stood at $12 billion, up 10% against last year. The new regulation on foreign property ownership in Vietnam took effect on July 1st, allowing foreigners to own a house in Vietnam up to 50 years for the first time. However, foreign businesses or individuals will only be allowed to buy a maximum 30% of any apartments in a particular block or a total of 250 houses in an entire world or commune. The 500,000 foreigners currently living in Vietnam not only need homes, but also business premises. 
The new regulations may create additional liquidity in the real estate market. We have just reviewed several economic and business highlights from last week. Up next, we'll talk about Vietnam-U.S. investment relations for the past 20 years in our crosstalk. On July 11, 1995, then U.S. President Bill Clinton announced the normalization of diplomatic relations between the United States and Vietnam. Over the past 20 years, Vietnam has emerged as one of the most attractive destinations for U.S. foreign investment, with more than half of the U.S. Fortune 100 companies having established a presence in Vietnam. In this special edition of Line, dedicated to celebrate the 20th anniversary of U.S.-Vietnam diplomatic relations, we'll review some notable trends and impacts of U.S. investment in Vietnam. Our guest speaker is Mr. Fred Burke, a managing partner at Baker and McKinsey Vietnam and also member of the Board of Governors of the American Chamber of Commerce in Vietnam. Before we talk, let's take a look at the following. Over 740 projects worth more than $11 billion dollars this represents the total direct investment from the United States in Vietnam as of May this year. These figures also mean that the U.S. ranks seventh out of the 101 countries and territories investing in Vietnam. The majority of U.S. investment is located in the hospitality and food industry, with 40% of the total investment and in the manufacturing and processing industry, with over 20%. The U.S. invested project is worth $14.9 million on average, higher than the $14.3 million average for the FDI sector as a whole. Besides setting up wholly owned subsidiaries or joint ventures, many U.S. corporations are investing in Vietnam through a third country meaning real U.S. investment is actually significantly higher than the official FDI figures suggest. Mr. Frackwright, thank you very much for agreeing to our interview today. Thanks. My pleasure to be here. As an expert with years of experience of working for foreign investors' projects in the country, especially U.S. investments, what notable trends have you noticed about U.S. investments in Vietnam over the past two decades? First of all, the growth in U.S. trade and investment has been really remarkable. Um, since I got here in mid-1991, um, when there was, a ver there was zero trade because the U.S. had an embargo, but um, if you look to the entry into effect of the bilateral trade agreement in 2000, uh, and then the accession to the WTO in 2006, Vietnam's exports to the United States have grown to about 35 billion now. That's really substantial. And with that comes uh, that trade, uh, investment usually follows trade. So now we have U.S. investment in Vietnam in everything from hotels to semiconductors. So it's really been um, an amazing process to watch just the broadening and the deepening of that investment trend. Why do you think U.S. investors are becoming more and more interested in investing in the country? I think Vietnam's strategy of global integration through aggressive negotiation of bilateral and multilateral uh, trade agreements has been very successful. Um, it has really obviously lifted tens of millions of people out of poverty by giving them jobs, by getting access to export markets. Uh, it's as simple as that. Um, trade, Vietnam is a poster child for international trade. Uh, I think, um, you know, if we watch uh, the, the, the development of American companies over that time, it's gone from very simple garment manufacturing, um, really sort of just based on low wages as the attra attraction, to nowadays when you've got skilled workers who are competing in a global digital economy, um, working in places like, uh, like Intel and, uh, and Apple, um, it's, it's, uh, it's, really, it's really progressed quite a bit. Uh, for U.S. investors eyeing Vietnam market right now, what um, sort of in incentives 
are they expecting? All countries are competing for investment, and it's a competitive global uh, fiscal environment. So um, every country has to offer some investment incentives. And Vietnam's investment incentives right now, after having been improved a bit, uh, actually are pretty competitive with the region and with uh, the, 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 the other regions. Um, they get uh, duty-free status for goods, uh, equipment that they need for their factories if those equipments are not available on the local market. They might get tax holidays or tax um, reductions if they're in certain encouraged areas such as high tech or clean energy, that kind of thing. Um, but I think, frankly speaking, what's more important than the incentives is really the overall economic environment. Do they have a reasonable tax rate? And in that respect, Vietnam's done very well. It's been coming down from 25% to 20% over a period of years uh, to compete with other countries in, in ASEAN, basically. So I think uh, on the tax side, we're finding that Vietnam's got a competitive set of incentives. Well, the one thing that investors do say, though, about the tax system is that the administration of the tax rules uh, could be more predictable and transparent and a little easier for taxpayers to deal with. Vietnam's Ministry of Finance held an investment promotion conference in New York on July the 1st. Entitled, My Vietnam, Your Investment Destination, the event was aimed at boosting U.S. investment in Vietnam's financial markets. Chúng tôi muốn các nhà đầu tư Hoa Kỳ hiểu rõ những nỗ lực, những thành công trong quá trình đổi mới, đặc biệt là chủ trương nhất quán của chính phủ Việt Nam trong việc khẳng định điều hành nền kinh tế theo cơ chế thị trường, cũng như luôn coi trọng và đánh giá cao dòng vốn đầu tư nước ngoài, đặc biệt là dòng vốn đầu tư từ các nhà đầu tư Hoa Kỳ. Over 150 funds were represented at the event, including those that have already invested in Vietnam and those considering the move. The liberalization of, of trade will obviously be a real positive for Vietnam, so maybe the textile sector, obviously the, the banking sector after its reconsolidation over these last few years could be very interesting. I think you'll see the energy sector, the mining sector, the gaming and leisure sector as sectors where they'll, you'll see in, infusions of cash into your country. To me, the top three are technology, electric utilities, and telecommunications because all of the things that are going to be happening where huge investments like in smart grid worldwide they're going to be investing a trillion dollars. U.S. funds at the event were particularly interested in the recently issued Decree 60 which eased the foreign ownership caps in equitized companies in most sectors. Uh, which sectors in Vietnam are emerging mm. as uh, attractive to U.S. investors? One of the strengths of Vietnam and, and one of its great uh, um, benefits is really that it's got a very diverse investment portfolio. Um, the economy itself is that way. It's, it doesn't depend on a single commodity or product or service for, its, uh, for its, all of its exports. It's got everything from natural resources to, to um, light industrial goods and now increasingly to digital and electronic goods. So uh, that's, that's great and it provides a lot of opportunities for investors to get involved in lots of different areas. So we see that happening. There's uh, automobile industry is, uh, is very attractive to U.S. investors when they want to sell cars to a, a population of more than 100 million people soon uh, who can increasingly inf afford it. But that also brings opportunities for people who build roads, who build airports, who build integrated transport solutions uh, because we all know that the traffic is a problem and that will need to be solved right. too. There's so many more that we couldn't even cover today. I've seen the digital economy grow quite a bit in Vietnam and what I mean by that is um, not necessarily hardware manufacturing manufacturing, although that's happening, but software development. Um, we have many, many uh, small, very entrepreneurial, um, digital uh, uh, you know, workshops where people are servicing or, or developing software for even for Facebook, for Google, for the big uh, multinational uh, um, you know, sort of internet companies. A lot of the software now is increasingly coming from Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And now let's hear from U.S. companies investing in Vietnam to find out more about their operations so far in the country and development plan in the future. General Electric, or GE, was one of the first U.S. companies to set foot in Vietnam in 1993, even preceding the lifting of the U.S. embargo. 
GE established a 100% subsidiary, GE Vietnam Limited, which currently employs over 750 people. Đồng hành cùng với cái sự phát triển của Việt Nam trong suốt hơn năm 20 năm qua thì chúng tôi cũng đã rất là tích cực tham gia vào các cái lĩnh vực, đặc biệt là cái lĩnh vực hạ tầng ở Việt Nam từ những cái lĩnh vực như là năng lượng, hàng không, thiết bị y tế và dầu khí. À, bên cạnh các cái hoạt động thương mại của GE ở Việt Nam à, thì chúng tôi cũng đã quyết định năm 2008 thì chúng tôi cũng đã quyết định đầu tư một cái nhà máy sản xuất các cái, cái linh kiện trong ngành điện gió. G plays a key role in the development of Vietnam's first wind farm in the Mekong Delta province of Bạc Liêu, supplying 62 wind turbines. In March 2015, the company was officially chosen to provide 14 turbines for the Tây Nguyên wind farm in Đắk Lắk province. The project will be Vietnam's largest capacity wind farm. Lĩnh vực điện gió, một cái lĩnh vực rất là mới mà Việt Nam rất là có tiềm năng, đồng thời là GE cũng có rất nhiều thế mạnh. Trong cái thời gian vừa qua, chúng tôi cũng đã phối hợp với lại các cái cơ quan của chính phủ Hoa Kỳ để hỗ trợ các cái chủ đầu tư từ những cái giai đoạn đầu tiên cho đến các cái, cái công việc cung cấp thiết bị cũng như là cái, cái việc sắp xếp tài chính và cái quá trình vận hành bảo trì bảo dưỡng sau này của các cái dự án. As energy and electricity demand in Vietnam is rapidly rising, GE is confident about its expansion in the country. In July 2011, the Vietnam Tail Motor Company Limited was renamed General Motors Vietnam, officially a member of GM Global. Its plant in Hanoi's Tangchi district assembles and distributes Chevrolet cars. For the past four years, the company has transformed its operation to align GM Global standards and reaped some positive results. Our dealerships, for example, have grown their business by almost 200% in the last four years. Our financials are better than we were earlier in terms of our customers rating our brand that they will buy a Chevrolet. We have improved by almost 50% in the last three years as well. GM Vietnam has particularly focused on human resource development. The company now employs over 500 people, 400 of which are working in its factory. And I'm very happy to say that we've been able to attract some of the best talent here in Vietnam, uh, develop them, nurture them, and also retain them in our company. Our attrition rates have fallen to less than, to, to very low single digits, both in our manufacturing and in also non-manufacturing area, which is a very good benchmark for Vietnam. And we also have our people training globally across uh, all the continents, whether it's in the US, or whether it's in Asia, etc. Coupled with Vietnam's low core penetration, large population and steady economic growth, GM Vietnam predicts strong growth for Vietnam's car industry in which it is gradually secured a foothold. An often cited issue is that Vietnamese firms do not yet have a strong presence in the supply chain of U.S. or U.S.-based multinational corporations. What can be done to fix this? Vietnam has only uh, very recently, in historical terms, even entered into the global economy as a major player in export markets. So um, the fact that we don't have you know, uh, a stream of retail chain in the United States is, is normal at this point. However, I think the thing to focus on is really getting more um, value added out of the domestic supply chain. And the government's been very focused on that, how to attract the suppliers that supply um, Samsung, for example. Samsung's making 40% of their global handset supply in Vietnam now. That's fantastic but the point is to integrate it so that more and more of the parts that go into those handsets are manufactured in Vietnam mm -hmm. so that's that's really the first step to getting you know, out on the other hand we do also see some Vietnamese companies like Viettel for example they're getting into telecoms markets and everywhere from Latin America to Africa so that's quite quite impressive concerning high-tech industries and manufacturing industries what opportunities for technology transfer and skills development are coming with US investment into Vietnam some of the technology transfer and skills development is very formalized. So, for example, Intel, they had some, they spent $32 million on upgrading the engineering skills that they found in Vietnam, which were very good, but they just had a little gap between what they needed to uh, apply those skills in their own manufacturing. So they took people to the United States and brought them back after getting degrees there. They had vocational training programs in Vietnam. They worked very closely with the Ministry of Education on that. It was a very satisfactory program. But that was, that's on one end of the spectrum that's very formalized and well 
self-funded. On the other end of the spectrum, you have um, service companies like you know the accounting firms, our law firms, design, construction, where people transfer skills on a day-to-day -day basis. And sometimes they'll send their Vietnamese staff abroad. Sometimes the foreign staff will come here. But the point is, they just get, learn a lot from each other, just working together. And that that's really changed things so much in Vietnam over the last 20 years. ngành công nghệ thông tin đó là cái sự thay đổi rất nhiều vậy thì à, chúng tôi đánh giá rất cao cái lắng nghe và cái mức độ cởi mở của cơ quan quản lý nhà nước à, thay vì đưa ra những quyết định để quản lý để cấm để kiểm soát à, thì có những cái quy trình mà chúng tôi đánh giá cao đó là đưa ra những cái dự thảo và lắng nghe các nhà đầu tư the penetration of automotive in Vietnam is among the lowest right now about 18 to 1000 people So if you look at the overall scenario, you have low penetration, you have a 90 million population, you have stable macroeconomic factors, and the direction of the government is in the right area in terms of lowering interest rates and opening up the market. So we believe that it actually is a good platform to grow investment in the automotive sector. Đặc biệt là trong cái lĩnh vực sản xuất và và chế biến thì Việt Nam là một trong những cái môi trường đầu tư có tính cạnh tranh cao. Tuy nhiên để mà thu hút được những cái đầu tư vào trong các lĩnh vực công nghệ cao thì tôi nghĩ là là Việt Nam sẽ còn phải uh, cải thiện uh, thêm cái môi trường đầu tư để ưu tiên cho các cái lĩnh vực công nghệ cao đồng thời là phải có những cái chính sách phát triển ngành công nghiệp phụ trợ. I'd like to see the United States become Vietnam's number one investor. I think with TPP, which I am optimistic we will conclude this year, that is a real possibility. There are also some other reforms that will help uh, attract, help Vietnam attract more foreign direct investment from the United States. Công ty Hoa Kỳ, đặc biệt là những công ty lớn, là họ có cái tầm nhìn lâu dài. Họ đã xác định là Việt Nam là một cái thị trường um, có nhiều tiềm năng và mang tính chiến lược. Hoa Kỳ và và Việt Nam ta là cơ cấu kinh tế nó bổ sung cho nhau. Nó không phải là cơ cấu kinh tế nó cạnh tranh nhau. Họ đầu tư vào đây là phải mình phải phát triển để có một cái thị trường cho họ. Mình phải nâng cái năng lực để của mình để trở thành đối tác của họ. Based on your experience, what do US companies see as challenges in investing mm. in Vietnam? Vietnam's legal system, its um, culture of business is still very, very different from the U.S. or North America in general. And I think um, some of the challenges that they face are um, the, the bureaucracy and the red tape, the things don't, um, aren't as predictable and transparent as they'd sometimes hope. That's, that's probably the, the, the most common challenge. You know, increasingly there's more and more people who can bridge that, that gap and, and you know, Vietnamese uh, professionals who've studied abroad and come back and understand both languages and cultures and can, can help facilitate that kind of, uh, you know, acculturation into the Vietnamese business culture. You know, Vietnam has a lot of advantages in culture. It has, you know, it's very, uh, People are hardworking. They value education. Um, the, the country is relatively organized and disciplined. But, um, but, but sometimes, um, especially in the administrative culture, mm -hmm. there's a, there's there's not quite the service mentality that people mm -hmm. might expect from from uh, from government departments. And I know the government has been really trying to to reboot that and and, and change that mentality with Project 30 and some other uh, initiatives that AmCham has been very involved in. And that mostly involves streamlining the administrative process to make it more automatic, more transparent, and a a lot of progress has been made in that respect, especially just in changing the mindset of people who make the rules so that mm -hmm. they make rules Law that makers. work well. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, you're one of the member of the Prime Minister's Advisory uh, Council on Administrative Reform. Correct, yes. And so how do you assess the changes in mm. Vietnam's administrative reforms for the past uh, few years? Uh, it's It's been a uh, very successful effort. I think that one, it, it reduced something like 4,700 administrative procedures that were streamlined or eliminated altogether. But it is a day-to-day -day battle, I have to say. Um, ministries are very good at coming up with new ideas that sound very important in terms of you know protecting consumers or you know national security, but in fact are actually generating more licenses and permits. So we have to be very uh, careful. Each time some new rule is proposed to see, well, is there an easier way to do it? Is there a way to do it that, that wouldn't give rise to some sort of uh, potential for obstructionism? In our following clip, we review Vietnam-U.S. cooperation in international economic forums.
The U.S. and Vietnam are both members of the APEC, Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, a forum for 21 Pacific Rim economies that promotes free trade and investment in the region. APEC member economies account for approximately 58% of global GDP and about 44% of world trade. The two countries are also members of the World Trade Organization. Vietnam's accession to the organization in 2007 was widely seen as a key factor in the rise in trade and investment activities between the U.S. and Vietnam over the past years. The two nations are also negotiating the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, along with 10 other countries. This trade agreement would provide member states with a level playing field to compete in markets that together account for almost 40% of global GDP. Vietnam and the United States have carried out their bilateral trade agreements since 2001. Both countries are members of WTO and APEC and are two of the 12 negotiating members for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. What future opportunities for U.S.-Vietnam investment do you see coming from these international collaborative platforms? On the American side, frankly, the uh, AmCham here in Vietnam has had to work very hard to convince U.S. lawmakers that the TPP is a win-win situation. Um, on the Vietnamese side, it's very obvious that it, it reduces duty rates very um, dramatically for some key Vietnam exports. I mentioned garments in particular. Um, but on the U.S. side, there's a concern that it, um, somehow Americans will be losing jobs to Vietnamese workers if those duty rates come down and those industries in the U.S. are no longer protected. Uh, frankly speaking, the way we see it is that most of those jobs would actually either come from China or they'd be new jobs, you know, creating new, uh, by the creation of new trade. Investment follows trade. Mm -hmm. And when we didn't, you know, the U.S. didn't buy any goods from Vietnam, it didn't invest in, in Vietnam. But as it bought more and more goods from Vietnam, it started to invest. And those investments could be in anything from, you know, the, the, the garment suppliers or the technical services to those, those production uh, companies, or um, in hotels and resorts as the com country becomes more affluent and, and people use those kinds of things. So um, that's been a natural development in the whole bilateral relationship. This year marks the 20th anniversary of the normalization of U.S.-Vietnam diplomatic ties. And as we've discussed uh, so far in our show, the two countries have come a long way in their investment ties. So um, what does the future hold for these two countries in this area of cooperation? I'm very reassured by what I'm seeing now, and, and I'm, I'm frankly very relieved to see that the U.S. Congress has come around on the TPP. Um, that will be an important stepping stone, you know, to even greater things in the future. Um, uh, the next step after TPP is a, all Asia free trade agreement, um, mm -hmm. where you know there will not be artificial um, barriers between all the different countries in, in Asia. So uh, at that point, you know, you'd really be able to take care of, uh, take advantage of Vietnam's competitive advantages in export markets. So you wouldn't have these artificial uh, uh, barriers into your export markets. Mm -hmm. um, Vietnam is really strategically positioned in Southeast Asia um, so that you know uh, it stands to benefit a lot from the integration of the supply chain that's going on. Vietnam will never produce 100% of, of, of most products itself, but as part of the global trading network, it may take parts from one country and another, put them together here, add some parts from Vietnam. This is the way the global supply chain works now, and uh, Vietnam is really well positioned to take advantage of it. Well, thank you very much for joining joining our program today. Okay, my pleasure. Thank you. With political stability, young population and steady economic growth, Vietnam is regarded by U.S. businesses as one of the most promising markets in Southeast Asia. Figures from the Foreign Investment Agency under Vietnam's Ministry of Planning and Investment show that as many as 742 projects worth over 11 billion U.S. dollars run by U.S. firms were being operated in Vietnam by the end of May this year. Those numbers will continue to grow as the two countries are among the 12 negotiating members of the Trans-Pacific Partnership to establish a free trade area constituting 40% of global GDP and one-third of the world trade. And that concluded our edition of Beastline this week. Thank you very much for being with us. Remember that you can always watch our show again online at vtv4.vn or youtube.com slash vtv4go. And goodbye for now.